Good morning. I want to greet every one of you in the worthy name of Christ this morning. He is the reason why we are here. And I love that the theme song, Brian, you talked about, or it talks about Jesus flow like a river. And that is my prayer this morning, that his spirit could flow freely in our midst today. So I want to welcome each and every one of you to the worship hour, visitors, those watching online, home folks. It's good to have every one of you here. Before I get into the message, I just... I want to give a little plug, a little shout out for the junior youth. Thank you, Steve and Mary and Mike and Londa. They are the two that are spearheading this. And I just, I want to bless you guys in what you're doing. I'm excited. So I just want to encourage you, bring your junior youth to, to church on Wednesday night. I know there's lots of empty seats here on Wednesday night, so don't worry about that part. Just come and I'm just... I'm excited. I'm also excited to see the youth plug in. We sent out a text to the youth asking for some of them to help out with this, and the response, the response was amazing. So I want to bless you, youth, for being willing to, to be a mentor, to be a role model for some of those that are, that are younger. So thank you, and, and blessings to you. The title of the message today is Small Beginnings. And bear with me, I'm going to take kind of a circuitous route going through a bunch of different stuff before I kind of get to it. So I'm going to be reading some scripture and then moving to some other stuff. So just kind of bear with me as I go through this. But you've been standing a lot, so I won't ask you to, to stand, but I invite you to turn to Acts chapter 9, verses 19 through 25. Acts 9, 19 through 25. And while you're turning there, I want to read one verse in Zechariah 4, verse 10. And just a little bit of context in Zechariah. This is uh, the prophecy of the, they were building the temple. After coming back from the exile, they were building the temple, and it looked hopeless to them. And this is God just affirming that it will be finished. It says, do not despise These small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin, to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. The seven lamps represent the eyes of the Lord that search all around the world. So just remember that phrase, do not despise the small beginnings. So Acts chapter 9, 19 through 25, this is uh, the story of Paul's conversion, and we're kind of Jumping in the middle of it, this is after Ananias came and laid his hands on him and the scales fell out of his eyes and he started, he could see again. So we're kind of jumping in right after that part. So beginning to read in verse 19. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent, that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. And that after, and after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying a wait was known of Saul, And they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and led him down by the wall in a basket. I'm just going to flip back a couple pages to chapter 13 and read verses 2 and 3 as well. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they have fasted, When they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we once again just invite your presence here. Flow like a river in our midst. Lord, I pray today that you would give me the ability to speak clearly, that your message could come forth. Guide us and direct us. We just invite your presence once again. In your name we pray. Amen. So, Like I said, I'm going to kind of leave you hanging here. We're going to leave Paul, and we'll come back to that later. I'd like to talk a little bit about missions today. 
And part of the inspiration was these men that were up here, and I want to bless each and every one of you for being willing to go. There was multiple things, but I want to kind of lay the foundation for what is missions, why it's important, and then we'll come back to the life of Paul. So missions. I came across this quote by Lauren Cunningham. It is to know God and to make him known. Very simple, to know God and make him known. And as I pondered that, I said, that is, in essence, is what our life and what missions is all about. about. We're called to know him and then to make him known to the world. So let's look at the foundation of missions and why it's important. So in Matthew 28, verse 18, we find the Great Commission. I'll just read those three verses there quickly. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So it's interesting. A couple Sundays ago I shared on, uh, there's three times in the Gospels that Jesus is given all authority. And one of the other times was in, in John 13, where he, after he was given all authority, what did he do? He knelt down and he washed the disciples' feet. Here we have another example where it says, Jesus, Jesus said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given me. What did he do? He commissioned his disciples to go out and to preach the gospel. It was always about bringing glory to God the Father. So that's our commission right there. Matthew 5, verse 14 also says, Ye are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hid. So why is missions important? Why should we go out and spread the gospel? So as I thought about missions, there's five things that came to me. And these are not exhaustive at all. And there's many other reasons why we do missions. But there were five things that came to me, and I called them the, the why, the how, and the who. The why, the how, and the who. So number one, why. Why do we go and do missions? It's very simple, because God loves the world. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. 1 Timothy 2 verse 4 says, Who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth? This may seem kind of simplistic, but it's the essence of it. The essence of it is God loved us first. Therefore, we go out and we share that love to other people. We share the story of what he did in our lives. So number two, the reason why we our call to missions is because it changes us. There's something about going out and sharing the gospel, sharing the story of what God has done in your life. It changes our perspective and our focus. It takes the focus off of ourselves and puts it on God where it belongs. And number three is linked to number two. And number two, it changes us. And number three, it also causes us to grow spiritually. I had to think back. Some of you were involved in the missions, uh, the New York trip when we went to New York City. And so many times I think back to those, those days and it was stretching. It was hard. You were taken out of your comfort zone. And many times you, didn't really, you weren't able to see the fruit of what, what you did. But on the way home on the bus, we always had a time of sharing. And it was just amazing how people's faith was strengthened by sharing the gospel. And that's exactly what happens when we do missions. When we go out and we share, our faith is strengthened. To know God and make him known. So number four, the how. Simple thought, we have to go to them. So I was just thinking about our church here. There's probably two to three hundred people here today. And we could probably squeeze four to five hundred people in here if we really had to. 
just in Holmes County alone, there's over 40,000 people. So there's no way that we can expect that the people we're going to reach are going to be here in our church, that that is how we're going to reach them. We have to go to them. We have to take the gospel with us wherever we go and speak the truth. All right, so hang with me here. We're kind of making a route here. We're coming around. I'd like to share just a little bit what my inspiration was for this message. So first of all, as I was thinking about you men that are going to Texas, and I just want to bless you for that. And also, I want to bless the families because there's wives and children that are at home keeping things going while you're gone. So I want to bless each and every, every one of you. So that was part of it. The other thing I... I recently heard a, a sermon, a podcast, and it was on small beginnings. So that was another part of it. The other big part of it was last week in that ADC. And I know, Jared, you, you shared on that, and I know your 10 minutes was, was not nearly long enough. And I hope sometime we can share, give you a better view of what all, what all was talked about. But Bill, Bill shared there, and there's a vision, there's a an excitement in ADC to grow missions. They want to start a, a missions arm of ADC. And afterwards, I was talking with Bill, and I, just, I was just telling him that this is something that I'm excited about, and it feels like it's something we can just put our shoulder behind and really get into. And Tim Byler, we talked a little bit about Tim Byler. Tim Byler was there as well, and I think he was actually here at our church talking about his time in Indonesia. One of the things that Tim did in Indonesia was business as missions. So his idea was we go to Indonesia, we start a business, and that's our platform to share the gospel. And Bill shared with me that he thinks that's probably going to be the future for most of missions because a lot of the countries don't want you there for no reason. You need to have a reason to be there. So business as missions is something that's probably going to be the focus for us in the future. And I'm excited about that. But as I was thinking about it, I was wondering, so what about us here at home? What do we do with that? And all of a sudden it just struck me that we have that opportunity right here. Each one of us has a job, has a place that we have responsibilities. We interact with people. That is our platform. That is how we share the mission with those around us. We have a beautiful and prime opportunity to show Christ wherever we go. So the last one is the who. Who is called? A lot of times when I thought about missions, especially when I was younger, I thought it had to be somebody with great insight, deep spiritual faith, somebody that was special. But as I looked at it, I realized that that is not at all the case. Each one of us is called to be to missions. I would propose to you that the moment that you ask Christ to come into your heart and his blood cleanse you from your sin and you became a part of the family of God, at that very moment is when you are called to missions. We are called to take that good news and to spread it to all people. So all people are called. So, back to the beginning. Don't despise the small beginnings, for they lead to great things. So David and Savea flood. I found this story recently, and I was very blessed by it. I don't know if you ever, ever heard of this story, but David and Savea flood were a couple missionaries from Sweden, I believe it was. And in 1921 they decided that they felt led to uh, minister to the people from Africa in the Congo. So after much prayer and preparation, raising money, they and a family called the Ericsons traveled to Africa with the idea of going back in and ministering to some of the tribes that had never heard the gospel. So they started out and they were literally hacking their way through the jungle at times to try to get to these villages. And one by one, each village turned them away. One by one, 
the village chief said that, no, we don't want you. They were afraid of angering the local gods. And finally, after many weeks of traveling, they came to a village, and they knew they were near the end of their energy, and also their supplies were, were running dangerously low. So they were just praying and pleading with God, please open a door here. Let this be the village that we can share to. And as they approached the village, this was the same story. The chief was even harsher than a lot of the other chiefs in saying, there's no way. Get out of here. We don't want you here. So in despair, they decided they're going to go up to the top of the mountain above this village and set up camp there because they knew they were too weak to keep going and they didn't have enough supplies to, to keep going. So they went up to the top, actually made mud huts and just kind of camped out there for a while. The chief allowed one young boy to come up and he would sell them chicken and eggs throughout the next couple weeks. David was in despair and he felt like this was useless. But Sevea decided that she is going to pour all of her energy into this one young boy. And throughout the next couple weeks, she spent time with him. She shared the gospel with him. She loved him. And amazingly enough, after a couple months, they knelt on top of that mountain and she led him to Christ. But things didn't really change. He wasn't allowed to share what had happened and he was, he was scared he would get kicked out of the village. So things really didn't change. After a while, the Ericsons gave up and said they're going to leave. They're going to go back. The floods decided they're going to stay there and, and keep going. And it was shortly after this that Savea discovered that she was pregnant, expecting a child. And through all of this, they were facing malaria and fever. And by the time she was ready to deliver the child, she was so weak, they weren't sure if she could even deliver the baby. When the baby girl was born, she had enough strength to whisper that her name should be Aia. And 17 days later, she passed away on that mountain. David, the father, was angry and bitter and done. He buried his wife, took his two children, and left and said he would never, he was done with God. He said he would never go back. Story goes on, Aia was, through many things, ended up with an American couple, went back to uh, the States, grew up in Minneapolis, married a godly man, and he actually became a president of a college in Seattle, but she had no connection with her, her family at all. One day, many, many years later, she received a, a, a Swedish newsletter in her mailbox. She had no idea where it came from. And as she was paging through it, she come, finds a picture and it's a picture of a cross, little gravesite on top of a hill with her mother's name on it. And she recognized it, but she couldn't read it. So she quickly jumped in her car and drove to, uh, I think there was a Swedish professor that, that taught at the college and asked him to read it. And as he read the story, it, it told the story of a group of missionaries that just recently came to this spot and they found a thriving church. And they asked him, how did this happen? And they explained the story that there was a couple there many years ago, and they had brought this young boy to Christ. This young boy, after many years later, asked the chief if he could build a school, and he built a school, and then he taught the children about God. The children became Christians. The children brought their parents to be to Christ, and through all of that, the chief actually became a Christian. Small beginnings. It looked completely hopeless. The, the story goes on. She, um, she ended up going back to Sweden and bringing her, her father back to Christ on his deathbed. It's an amazing story. If you want to read, there's more information. Uh, she actually met this young boy later on and goes back to that village where she is just greeted with cheers. It's, it's like a total opposite of how their parents came there. Amazing story of how God took small beginnings and did something mighty and great. So, now we're finally back to the story of Paul. Paul's small beginnings. So often when I read the story about Paul, I read the story and I see the conversion, I see his change, and then it talks about him starting to preach the gospel, and then it's a couple chapters later, four chapters later, he's on his missionary journey. 
So you think that Paul was converted and just immediately jumped into the ministry. But I invite you to turn to Galatians 1, 15 through 18. Paul's time of small beginnings. <clears throat> 1, 15 through 18. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those, to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Now notice this. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. Isn't that interesting? So if you read Acts, you think all this happens quickly. But here Paul says that he went away to Arabia, which was the country just to the east, and he spent three years there being taught and learning about the gospel of Christ. Even more, let's read um, Acts 9. I'll just quickly read this. Acts 9, 26 through 30. And it says, When he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And I noticed this, and when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So not only after spending three years in Arabia, he goes to Jerusalem. What do they do? They send him back to his hometown. If you look at the timeline, he actually spent another four years in his hometown, learning, growing. The interesting thing is, Acts shows it four chapters later, him going on a missionary journey. That four chapters is actually 11 to 12 years of Paul in his small beginnings. Paul being taught... Paul growing and learning. Don't despise your small beginnings. So in conclusion, what does this mean for us? So one thing I want to make very clear, and I talked about this before, each one of us is called to missions. Each one of us has a responsibility to be faithful to that call that God has placed on us. So it's not like just a few people. All of us are called. And there's some of us who have great visions of reaching the lost, unreached people groups, going to deepest, darkest Africa. And I love that. I love it. Praise the Lord. I'm excited when I hear people with visions like that. But don't despise the small beginnings. The time you're at right here is when God is working in your life and preparing you for his plan. And I emphasize his plan because it is his plan, not our plan. And there's those of us who are called to be here at home, who are content to be at home. Praise the Lord. There is need for you here. We have a platform here that we can reach so many people. Let's use that platform. Let's be faithful in that. One more story here, Susanna Wesley. I was so blessed by her story. So you might recognize the Wesley name. She was the mother of John and Charles Wesley. And she was the youngest of 25. And that in itself is a story. I don't know, I, I can't imagine 25 children, but she was the youngest and so her father was a preacher, and she got to spend a lot of time with her father. And she grew up with visions of reaching thousands of people. That's what she wanted to do. She wanted to preach and teach and, and, and reach, reach out to people. But the Lord had other plans. At the age of 19, she was married and ended up having 19 children, nine of which passed away. So she was, should I say, stuck at home? The, doesn't sound right, but that she was given the responsibility of raising these children, and she decided that she was going to give it all she had. She was married to a preacher as well, but he wasn't much 
Maybe that's what they say about me. He wasn't much of a preacher, I guess. <laughs> he, uh, he wasn't good with money. He spent time in debtor's prison. So the responsibility fell on her to raise these children. And she decided to do the best she could. One thing she determined, she would never spend more time in leisure than she does in time with God. And one of the things she would do in a house full of children, she would sit in the middle of the kitchen, she would raise her apron up above her head, and when she did that, the children knew that she was spending time with God. They knew that they could not disturb her. Interesting thing is, you know, she had a vision of reaching thousands, millions of people, but she was never able to do that. She had nine, ten children that survived, and that was her mission field. And she poured her life into them, and now we can look back and see what happened when John Wesley and Charles Wesley started their ministry. John went on to be a great evangelist, and I think they say he probably preached preached to millions of people. Charles Wesley went on to become a great musician and wrote many, many songs. So, mothers, you have a calling as well. So many times your job probably seems thankless and unappreciated. It's behind the scenes. Nobody sees it. But God sees it. And you have a tremendous calling to pour your life into those children. I just want to bless each one of you mothers for what you're doing. So there are so many needs around us. Someone once said, instead of asking God, what is your will for me, simply look at what God is doing and join in. One more thing here. Bill shared a story last week about William Carey, and I asked him if I could use it. So William Carey, at his farewell at his church, before he was going to go to India as a missionary, said this, I will go down into the pit if you hold the rope speaking to his church. It has been said that behind every successful mission is a thriving community. It's a thriving church. So I just want to challenge us. Are we holding the rope? I think of Sarah. Does Sarah feel us holding the rope? And I also thought, dare I say this, there's lots of room on the rope. Let's get out there. Let's get on the rope. Let's see how many people we can hold. Jared, you or somebody, Jared, I think you talked about being a sending church. I, I would love to be a sending church, to hold the rope for all of, all of you that are, are going out there. The needs are plentiful. Youth, I just want to bless you. I know some of you are helping with Frog Pond. Bless you for doing that. I know that there's a need for somebody to lead Bible study at the jail. If God is nudging you, go for it. Don't push it away. So wherever you find yourself, if you're one that has grand visions, you want to go out to deepest, darkest China and Africa, praise the Lord. I love that vision. Don't throw that away. Or if you're content to be here at home and hold the rope, that is part of the mission. Holding that rope is part of it to support those that go. Give it all you've got and don't despise the small beginnings. Let's pray. Dear Lord, as we come to you today, Lord, we are so grateful for what you've done, and it is only because of what you've done that we can go out and share that story with others. Lord, truly change our hearts. Help us to grasp what you've really done for us, to see that how you loved us when we were completely unlovable. Help us to love people in the same way that you have loved us. Guide us as we go forth. We honor you. We glorify you. In your name we pray. Amen.